Welcome back to another episode of Grizzly True Crime. My name is Gisela Kay, and today I am honored to share with you an interview that I had with Dr. Shoham Das, a forensic psychiatrist based in London in the UK. And my word, his work is very fascinating. So what I've done is I've linked his channel in the description box, as well as his website where you can read more about him and his books and all of those kinds of links are there. So make sure you click on that official link as well. And if you like interviews like this and picking experts brains, please do like the video, subscribe, hit the bell and share. Okay, so let's get started. Please note that this content is for adults only. Viewer discretion advised. If you haven't yet, Hit the subscribe, like, and share. So thank you so much, Gazella, for having me on on Grizzly True Crime. My name is Dr. Shaham Das. I'm a consultant forensic psychiatrist. So basically, I professionally assess and rehabilitate people who are mentally disordered offenders, right? Or what the tabloids might call the criminally insane. So people that have committed fairly serious crimes, usually they're already on remand, like in prison, and they either have a mental illness or they're suspected of having a mental illness. So my job is to assess them and work as an expert witness uh, give evidence in court to decide, do they have a mental illness? Yes or no. If so, are they criminally responsible for their crimes? Yes or no. Uh, what kind of treatment they need if uh, mental illness has driven their crimes? And I'm also a struggling YouTuber. So I'm, I've got my own channel, which is uh, small and growing very, very slowly and frustratingly. <laughs> You're going to have a bunch of grizzlies coming over. <laughs> oh, great. Care, care, careful what you wish for. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my channel is called A Psych for Sore Minds, and it is anything related to mental illness or criminality or the crossroads between the two. So occasionally I talk about my own cases, although I'm a bit limited because I can't name any of the uh, defendants I see um, because of the patient doctor, doctor confidentiality. So uh, like yourself, I sometimes jump on sort of high profile cases that are going on nowhere near as uh, quick and reactive as you are. So sometimes a, a, I don't hear about cases or have the time to address cases for like months afterwards. In the Letitia style case, the topic of malingering came up quite a lot, and you have some brilliant videos already that I'd love for everyone to check out on it. But for those who don't know, what is malingering? Sure. So malingering in general is when a individual, a patient, fabricates or exaggerates symptoms to try and make themselves look ill when they're not. So in its very most basic form, somebody might, you know, fake a headache or exaggerate back pain because they want a doctor's certificate so they don't have to go to work. Then in the psychiatric context, it gets a bit more complicated. Uh, I would probably argue that most people wouldn't malinger for psychiatric symptoms if, because you, you don't want psychiatric treatment if you don't need it. The exception being exactly what is my area of expertise, which is defendants who are on charge for criminal trials. Uh, I'd say I'd see it fairly regularly. So probably every two or three months, I come across a defendant who I strongly suspect is either completely making it up or is exaggerating. And I have to say, it's actually quite easy to spot when people are doing this, from my experience. And what would one look out for Especially, you know, for us in daily life that aren't um, specialists like you, if you, if someone is exaggerating or, I don't know, playing the victim when they shouldn't, all that, what are the signs that we could uh, look out for that they're doing? Sure. That? So I've actually got um, my my most recent proper video on my channel. This is literally called something like how to fake uh, mental illness to get away with murder. So that's a, obviously it's a bit tongue in cheek, but it, it's kind of addressing exactly this. Um, so the reason why it's quite easy to spot. And, and I think some of, some of these issues are very relevant to the Letitia Stouch case, is because when somebody becomes really mentally unwell, so I'm not talking about a bit of mild background anxiety, depression that many of us, most people probably experience at some point in their lives. I'm talking about severe mental illness, so something like psychosis, schizophrenia. Firstly, the, um, their functioning will decrease over time, right? So it's not something that happens overnight. Well, actually, I rephrase that. It can very rarely happen spontaneously overnight, but exceptionally rare, you know, less than 5% of cases. The vast, vast majority of the time is something that happens gradually over months, sometimes even years, and one's functioning decreases. So what that means is if you've got somebody who says that they're hearing voices, that they have paranoid delusions, but they're going to work, nobody's noticed anything, they're 
uh, you know, socializing, they're still going out, they're maintaining a normal family life, and nobody you know, questions any of this, then you have to be suspicious. So the first thing I do is I don't just look at how they present in front of me when I assess them in prison. I look at all the evidence. I look at their doctor's notes, psychiatrist notes. I speak to their relatives, speak to people that they work with. So that, that's to get an impression of, of how they're functioning in general now. The second thing is that I look at all the evidence uh, during the actual case itself. So often we get um, things like CCTV, witness statements from other people that might have witnessed, say, if it's an assault or even a murder. Uh, you look at the police interview transcripts. So I, I suppose Letitia's case is slightly different because there was no, obviously there's no witnesses and a bit of a time lapse. But most of the time in the cases that I see, if somebody's committed an assault, then they're arrested within, say, 24 hours, 48 hours. And you have, like, I'm sent a police transcript and sometimes the actual footage of the police interview. So if they're saying that they ha are hearing voices and that's the reason they attack somebody, then I'm looking for whether they're presented that way in the police interview and in the CCTV footage and the witness statements uh, of everybody else who witnessed the actual offence. And then finally, the last thing I'd say is that from my experience, people that are actually mentally ill, so say paranoid, hearing voices, psychotic, uh, understandably, they don't have an agenda. So they don't try and convince me, right? So if you're genuinely paranoid and you think people are trying to hurt you, and then you've never met me before and I come in and assess you just some chump in a, in a shirt and a waistcoat, you wouldn't tell me that you're you know, hearing voices or you're paranoid. You'd be quite sort of cagey and it would take a lot of effort to elicit those symptoms. Whereas from my experience, people that try and fake it, they they don't understand that. So they, they try too hard from the beginning to convince me that they're mentally ill, like, you know, right from the first few minutes of meeting them. <laughs> exactly. And for me, when I looked at Letitia and all the footage they showed, the mental evaluations, Yes, she was doing that, number one. And two, there's no sign of suffering. They almost talk about it as if it's something fun to have. Like, yeah. where's the suffering, though? <laughs> Normally, if you are struggling uh, with any mental disorder, mental illness, you, you're suffering. So. Yeah, absolutely. You know, if you're struggling to the degree that you're not in control of your actions, which is what she was claiming, then you would be, your level of functioning in, every, in everyday life would be uh, definitely affected. And like, we didn't see that in her case. Oh, heck no. And we saw her malingering, pretending to have dissociative identity disorder and literally thinking that coming into the courtroom with different hairstyles is what that means. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. I suppose, I suppose somebody like her doesn't realize that an expert such as myself has seen like literally hundreds, if not thousands of cases. Uh, so they think maybe she's perhaps a bit overconfident that she can just think her version of what dissociative identity disorder looks like, then hopefully that would fool the experts. But, you know, just like any any clinician or any you know doctor in a, in a particular niche, if you see it loads and loads and loads of times, day in, day out, then it's really easy to spot when it's not genuine. Yes. And do you think people like Letitia ever come to terms with, with what they've done? Um, yeah, I suppose it depends on their personality structure. It depends on their kind of mental state at the time of the offence. So, uh, just to give you like extreme examples, I've, I've, I've in my career, I've definitely assessed people who were really unwell. One that jumps out in my mind is um, a young woman that I assessed who was about 18 years old at the time, who was floridly psychotic, had exactly what I'm talking about. So she had delusional beliefs uh, about her nephew and she ended up killing her when she was uh, killing him when he was she was babysitting him because she genuinely believed at that time that he had demons inside of him and that, that she was removing these demons. Different to Letitia, uh, because she didn't try and cover up any of her actions or say this, you know, retrospectively. She she said that consistently throughout. You know, even but she didn't even try and hide what she'd done because she didn't think she did anything wrong. Um, but sorry, I'm going off on a tangent. So somebody like her, when they get better, absolutely they regret their actions because they weren't really in their frame of mind. Somebody like Letitia, who I don't believe had a mental illness, you know, it really does depend on a lot of different factors. Uh, sometimes time. So somebody, you know, she, she obviously had uh, an agenda and a reason, I believe, because she hated a stepson and she was, you know, jealous of his actual mother. That's not likely that going to change in the immediate future, but possibly as somebody matures, you know, after 10, 15 years in prison, maybe she will genuinely show remorse. I suppose it's, it's hard to know what's genuine remorse versus, you know, what somebody's saying that they feel, that they feel uh, guilt. Yes. Do you think some people do not have the capacity to feel remorse the same way they don't have any capacity to feel empathy? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, what we're starting to talk about, I think, is, is personality disorders, right? So um, I'm, I'm sure you've heard these terms, antisocial personality disorder, 
and psychopathy, which is like the older brother of antisocial personality disorder. The, the, one of the key features of those is, as you say, lack of empathy, impulsivity, uh, you know, aggression, not caring about the rights and wrongs of other people, and a lack of being able to feel remorse, not just remorse from what you've done, but also a lack of being able to learn from previous punishments. So, for example, a person who, who, for whatever reason, committed a crime, went to prison, who didn't have this kind of personality disorder, would reflect on the impact that it's had, not just on the victim, but, you know, say their family and friends from going into prison. They would have genuine remorse. They don't want to be in that situation again. Whereas somebody with that kind of personality disorder, they're, they're not going to learn. They don't, they don't change their behavior. What is gaslighting? Because that's slightly different to malingering from what I understand. So what is gaslighting? Sure. So malingering is, is only kind of faking a symptom for a, a, uh, a reason for, for some benefit to yourself. Gaslighting is quite different. So gaslighting is like a, a form of abuse. It's where you lie to somebody, but you, can, you try and convince them that they were mistaken. So it's not just about telling them something that's not true. It's about making them feel that, that you were right all along. So in its simplest form, you could say something like, uh, say there's a domestic violent relationship and say it's a man uh, acting violently towards a woman, which is most, most often the case. Uh, he, might, he might try and separate the victim from her family and keep her isolated. So he might tell lies. He, they, they say they're all going out for family dinner. He doesn't want her to have the support of her family. So he makes up conversations that were had over dinner about the family members of the of the victim saying nasty things about both of them that it didn't happen, but but he convinces her that it did happen uh, over time, and it's actually scary and it's uh, quite effective and it's it's kind of almost like grooming, so it's it's gradually changing somebody's uh, vulnerability over time. Because I'm asking that because of Letitia Stout's daughter, a lot of people are like, obviously she knew, and why would she go buy cleaning products, and why would she this? But it just seems like she was a victim not only of Letitia's speculative narcissism i'm not saying that to armchair diagnose it's based on what the expert said on the case <laughs> i know the yeah. word gets thrown around a lot right but the coercive control and the narcissism and then the gaslighting i mean to be a victim in that way of Letitia, it makes sense though right that the daughter didn't ask too many questions at that point yeah absolutely especially if she's got a controlling and dominating mother who she's probably scared of uh, remind me how old was the daughter at that point she was 17 at that point 17. So I suppose, you know, old enough to have an understanding of how life works, but still young enough to be quite heavily influenced, I think. Somebody who is 17 and well, well balanced, who has a big social circle, who has a lot of external influences, who's, you know, confident in themselves, would be less vulnerable to being controlled and to being gaslit versus somebody like Harley, who, who doesn't have you know anybody else. Because it's easy for us or anybody to to kind of judge externally but if that's even if you're scared and terrified of that person if that's the only person that you've got a connection to then it, you know it's it's um it's terrifying to think that you might lose that connection even though it might be quite poisoned and toxic it, itself exactly i mean when they drove all the way from colorado to florida they she wasn't even allowed to have a change of clothes she didn't ask questions really because Letitia said don't we're not opening that we're going the whole way they didn't check in with bags they checked in in multiple hotels always oh, the candlewood suites <laughs> multiple hotels across the country not a change of clothes which people then obviously yeah. say why 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 but like because she's with Letitia yeah. that's why yes I mean she even grabbed her phone and resigned for her on the day they left like thank you so much uh my time here is done hope we can leave on good terms like Holly didn't even get to resign herself yeah Yes. What does insanity mean, especially in these criminal cases? Yeah, so that's a great question. So I would say that there are different versions of insanity. There's the layman's person, uh, sorry, lay, lay person's term, which is often if somebody does something that they can't understand, the average person can't understand. So they would say that anybody who, I don't want to say the words to, <laughs> to kill your YouTube channel, uh, but anybody that commits like offenses against children or, you know, um, sort of terrorist attacks, those kind of things, by definition are insane because they can't understand why they would do that because we all have our social and moral boundaries. Um, the psychiatrist definition, I guess, would be a men an actual diagnosable mental illness, probably a psychotic mental illness like schizoaffective disorder or schizophrenia that has specific symptoms, as I was mentioning before, auditory hallucinations, delusions. That would be my definition of insanity. I wouldn't use the term insanity clinically, but um, I'd use the term psychotic, but none of that really matters. The important uh, terminology is the legal 
test for insanity. So in this is slightly different different places in the world, but in the UK, to have the finding of not guilty by reason of insanity, it means that you've got a recognizable mental illness. You were suffering with symptoms at the time of the offense that you committed. You either didn't know what you were doing or you didn't know what you were doing was wrong. So I'll give you an extreme example of, of those things from patients that I've seen, from defendants I've seen. So it's quite rare to see somebody that didn't know what they were doing. So I can think of a man who, it's quite a long time ago, who uh, believed that he was burning demon. That he had these paranoid delusions about del- demons um, living in his kitchen. So he tried to, he did a little ritual and he set a fire on a stove he was so kind of uh, confused and perplexed he was hearing voices at the time that he literally forgot about the fire it spread it burnt like um a couple of uh, flats down in the apartment complex luckily nobody was caught he was charged with arson but there was i could quite easily prove with the evidence that he didn't literally didn't know he was starting a fire because uh, of his symptoms more commonly than that people did know what they were doing but they didn't know it was wrong so, for example, if they, in fact, the, the, the young girl that I talked about before, um, Yasmin, I, I, is not her real name, but that's how I refer to her in my videos, in my book. So she didn't, she knew what she was doing. She knew she was ending her, her nephew's life, but she didn't know what she was doing was wrong because she had delusional beliefs and in her head, what she was doing was right and was necessary. So to get the insanity plea, you have to have one of those two things. And, I, and the other thing I should say is that only a very small minority of patients that I assess Actually, I think um, there is evidence to suggest that they should get the insanity plea. It's probably like less than 5% of cases that I see. Right. And I know you said you don't know too much about the Lori Vello case, but that it kind of sounds like that except for. So if I say Lori Vello seems to have delegated the murders, she seems to have a belief that she's some kind of religious vigilante taking out zombies, you know, taking out demon infested people, including her children by then using a brother <laughs> so we're using a brother to kill them but then she collects the life insurance so i think that could probably remove the insanity not that there's an insanity plea in idaho but that removes the insanity factor right where she's like on the next the next day she's calling for life insurance yeah yeah so that really does sound quite calculated doesn't it it seems like there's a there's a reason there's an agenda right and even looking at the teacher stout despite what she claimed if you didn't know, if she didn't know what she was doing was wrong, if it was like, you know, this other personality, why would she have driven, why would she try to hide the evidence? So she wouldn't have driven all the way, you know, 13, 1300 miles to try and get rid of the body if she knew what she was doing was uh, wrong. If she, sorry, if she didn't know what she was doing was wrong, right? Never mind the fake I, polygraph test. Remember that? She literally tried to order a fake polygraph test. I mean, why would you do that if you didn't know what you were doing was wrong? Absolutely. Yeah. And in the cases that I see, and, and you know, uh, just to reiterate, it's only a very, uh, very small minority that I think reach the threshold for the insanity plea. They don't try and cover their tracks because they, you know, they literally don't think they've done, done anything wrong. So they're, they're quite open about what they did. And in fact, they're surprised usually that other people uh, are accusing them of doing something wrong. Uh, so a case that I, I frequently talk about in my YouTube video is Andrea Yates. So um, I'm sure as a true crime fan, you know about this one. So in 2001, she tragically, really horrible case, she killed her own five children. Right, and it's actually similar to that to that young woman, Yasmin, who I assessed. Uh, and it was because she believed that they were marked by the devil and she felt that she had to do it to, to kind of save their lives, stop them going from hell. She called the police herself and she called her husband immediately afterwards. Uh, you know, that is the the action of somebody. And, and, and explain what she did. She didn't, you know, try and she didn't she didn't act like a guilty person who's trying to cover her tracks that to me suggests that she li- she literally didn't know what she was doing was wrong mm-hmm. interesting yes that is actually a good example five five children yeah, it's very sad. so if we think about the term projection it seems like leticia was projecting all of her jealousy towards gannon's mother maybe her whether it's an abandonment issue or Um, resentment towards her husband being neglectful in her mind why would she project all of that onto Gannon the boy the one child and not the other stepchild like why would someone focus so much on one which I think is called like the Cinderella syndrome or something right Uh, it's a good question I'm I don't I'm I'm afraid I don't know enough about her relationship with the two of them to to be able to answer it confidently Um, what was how I know you said that she's quite controlling over over Harley, but how, aside from that, how do they get on? Like, was she closer to him, for example? 
She says so. But Al, her ex-husband, Ganon's dad, said that she was absolutely closer to Lena, the the eight-year-old girl. So she lies about that too. (laughs) She lies about everything. But she's just she said I was way closer to Ganon, but she really wasn't. It's just odd how she relates. I have stomach problems, so does Ganon. I'm just like yeah. him. Like she almost sees herself in him in a way. And then there's all yeah. that resentment and jealousy and she just took everything out on him. That does sound very odd. I do wonder, and this is complete speculation, I don't know this for facts, but I do wonder whether in her mind he reminds her of somebody. So like Al, for example, I know she she um, had a lot of negative feelings and hostility towards him. I believe he, she was intending on leaving him. Did I get that right? She was Googling, yeah, starting a new life, getting her own apartment, yeah. kind of like one bedroom. Yeah. So it could be as simple as, as Ganon reminded her of Al. So that, that could be a reason that she sort of projects all this hatred onto him. And she brings up her stepdad quite a bit, which she's, she says he sexually abused her. She calls him yeah. Jackass James, <laughs> the stepdad. What's... Um, yeah. She has a massive history of this lying. So would you think... That she's a pathological liar and if so why do people do this <laughs> yeah so <clears throat> a true pathological liar lies for no particular reason so they lie it's not because they try to gain anything out of any individual lie it's not because they try and make themselves look better or you know a, to impress anybody a true pathological liar just does it for the sake of it there's some sort of weird pleasure that they get from deceiving people rather than the content of what they're saying whereas i think what i know about Letitia is it feels a lot more calculated so i don't think it's a psychiatric diagnosis i think she's just somebody who's you know naturally dishonest and has very little empathy and, and cares very little about societal norms and rules so it's not a it's you no know, it's not a psychological issue she's just a liar liar pants <laughs> on fire right um, yeah so so i have read a little bit about the evidence that she gave and it seems weak i think that's probably the the most politest way that i could say of doing it uh, she couldn't answer a lot of the questions and she couldn't answer really important questions as well. So I believe when she was cross-examined, when she was asked whether, well, she seems to believe this this diagnosis of, of um, DID and when Letitia was in this different personality state, was she responsible for knowing what she what she was doing? And from what I understand, Dr. Lewis said she didn't know on several occasions. And my kind of problem with that is that is literally the most important point of giving evidence as a forensic psychiatrist so when i give my evidence i have to write these really long detailed reports probably about 58 four pages long the paragraph that matters the most is is somebody criminally responsible that's that's really what the judge actually wants to know you need to put everything else for the context the diagnosis and causative factors and blah, blah blah but i suppose what i'm trying to say is is why give evidence if you can't answer the most basic question that is literally why you're there uh, so I don't know enough about her background, the, the, the doctors that is, I don't know if she's an experienced expert witness or not, but if she is, then I'm surprised that she can't answer that question. If she's not experienced, then why is she giving evidence in a trial of murder for a child? Like, I don't think mm-hmm. she has, if she doesn't have the confidence and the expertise to do it, then she shouldn't have put herself forward for that case. Yes, I mean, to also walk in and diagnose someone instantly with DID is quite a jump because there's a lot of dissociative disorders and other disorders before that. Not that it's a hierarchy, but you know what I mean? It's like anxiety, PTSD, CPTSD, and so many other dissociative disorders before DID. But she walks in, oftentimes with killers, and they instantly have DID, according to her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And especially considering that DID in itself, as I'm sure you know, is quite a contentious diagnosis. So I think most psychiatrists would uh, would fully support a potential diagnosis, not not in Letitia's case, but in general, would be able to confidently say, this is PTSD, this is schizophrenia. You know, I've seen this many times. I know what delusional disorder is. DID is exceptionally rare. Um, I've never seen a credible case in my career. I've seen a few people try and fake it. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I'm just saying that I, you know, I, I, until I see one, I, I'm a bit of a ag- agnostic, I guess, rather than an atheist. <laughs> Uh, so my point being is how can she make such a confident diagnosis on something that she must know that most psychiatrists are skeptical, or not, not necessarily most, but some uh, good proportion of psychiatrists are skeptical about. Is hybristophilia always sexual? Uh, so hybristophilia is a, for your viewers, is a uh, an interest in uh, or an, an attraction to somebody who has uh, committed serious violence or is quite notorious in terms of being like a serial killer, for example. So you have these 
like Ted Bundy's a perfect example of somebody who's arrested, get, becomes infamous, famous, and then gets lots of letters, love letters from women. To answer your question, is it, is, is it always sexual? No, no. So I think the psychological kind of um, processes behind it are, sadly, that a lot of the women, and I'm saying women because the vast majority of the time it's women that, that approach men who are serial killers, uh, a lot of the women have a history of abuse themselves. So they come, they're, they're actually quite damaged. And unfortunately, they gravitate to what's familiar rather than what's safe. But the kind of twist is that when they start a relationship with these men in prison, you know, these serial killers, they get to control the relationship potentially first, first for the first time in their lives because they're usually the victim of, sort of being in a controlling relationship and dominated. So that's one thing. The other thing is that sometimes they have this very strong kind of nurturing, mothering instinct, um, almost like a, a kind of God complex, a savior complex, I should say, of trying to cure somebody and who's better to cure and who's more damaged than a serial killer. So to answer your question, I don't think it is sexual. I think it's those things. It's, it's kind of wanting to control after being controlled, number one, or separately uh, wanting to uh, heal somebody who's completely broken. They might you know, still be in a sexual relationship, but that's not, that's not the core of what it is. It's just one element of the wider picture. In all those cases you've assessed, examples of people trying to malinger with DID. Yeah, so I would say the most common form of malingering that I see is probably somebody who says that they were psychotic, so they're hearing voices at the time. That's that's the most common thing. Secondly to that, that they blacked out and they can't remember anything. You know, got huge memory gaps. Uh, and they even if that was true, and obviously it's really hard to prove either way because because anybody can fake any kind of memory test. But even if it's true, that's not a psychiatric defense because it's not about whether you can remember something now, it's about your mental state at that time. And the third one is probably DID, so is that there was another kind of character in me and um, you know it controlled everything that I did. And, and I'd, I'd probably argue that it's even easier to spot a fake case of DID because uh, it usually happens in the con almost always happens in the context of somebody who's had a very very long history of childhood trauma so it's usually somebody who's you know been sexually abused over a long period of time usually by a parent or a sibling for example uh, and they're just very damaged people so again a bit like the t-shirt if you have all that in your background and it's never been mentioned you know there's no social services reports you've not had any behavioral problems as a child you've not had any mental health issues uh, you know, you never tried to seek therapy for any of the, any of those issues, and then you suddenly claim to have the idea. It doesn't work like that. It's not something that suddenly comes out on the spot. You know, very conveniently after you committed a crime, it's something that's been there, uh, and it's probably taken over your entire life for most of your life. So that's that's why it's easier to spot in the in the, in the linguas. Is a mental institution is it better than prison? <laughs> uh, that's a very good question. I would. So I've, I've, I've worked in quite a few places like that. So I've worked in low, medium and high secure. I suppose my answer would be this, right? If you've actually genuinely got a mental illness, then it's better for you because you'll be, you'll be receiving the therapy and the medication that you need. So say you're tortured by voices telling you to hurt yourself or kill yourself. Uh, you're, you can still get medication in prison, but if you don't have the insight and you don't um, consent to that medication, then you'll just get iller and iller and iller. They, these kind of disorders, psychosis, tend to get worse over time if they're untreated. So if you're mentally ill, then it's much better for you because you get the treatment you need, you get the therapy, you're surrounded by people who are, uh, you know, of, who are actually, actually very unwell because the threshold to get into these places is so high. If you're mentally unwell and you're in prison, you don't get the medication, you're probably surrounded by criminals who might take advantage of you, they might target you, they might beat you up, they might bully you, they might you know, take your things knowing that you're somebody that, that's you know, not fully uh, complimentous. But if you're not mentally unwell, so if you're faking it, like the teacher seems to have done, or did, if you're faking it and then you end up in a psychiatric unit, which, which by the way is actually quite hard to get into because as I say, you know, the threshold to get into quite high, you have these experts such as myself that they're trying to figure out. But if you do somehow manage to fake it, then from my experience, they have a horrible time because it's slightly more comfortable. You know, it's still a locked unit. You still don't get to leave. Uh, and it's, it's, it's more comfortable than that you, you don't have prison cells, you have rooms, but everything's still locked. You're still contained. It's a nicer environment because you've got sofas and pool tables, you know, instead of cells. But you're kind of surrounded by mentally ill people. 
So uh, over time, you get quite frustrated because you might not necessarily have criminogenic peers to spend time with, to talk to. Uh, obviously, people are at different stages of recovery, but the vast majority of them, you might struggle to have a decent conversation with. So over time, people that have faked it usually hate the environment and just want to go back to prison. What do you think someone like Letitia, how do you think she would behave in prison now if they say she's got narcissistic uh, qualities and borderline qualities? Like what type of inmate would she be? Yeah. Uh, before I answer about her personality structure, I would actually say that more relevant to that is the fact that she's really high profile and that she has killed a child. So what that means is that uh, everybody in her prison will know who she is and what she's done. And there's a hierarchy uh, within prisoners, uh, especially so in the male male prisons, but also to a less degree in female prisons. And if you've hurt a child, or if you've like committed a sexual assault against a child, you're at the bottom of the hierarchy, you are bullied relentlessly, you're kind of seen as a piece of dirt. And remember, we're talking about some damaged prisoners who have a history of violence, and they might have an inferiority complex because they're judged by society. So it's it's one of the only opportunities where they get to to judge somebody else to higher up the hierarchy. So I think that more than her personality will affect her experience of prison. I think that she will be uh, hated. She'll be probably assaulted. I assume that she's going to go to a maximum security prison, which means that the the clientele in there are going to be more violent than lower secure kind of establishments. But in terms of your question about her narcissism and her borderline, so generally, you know, as I'm sure you know, people who with with narcissism, want to be the center of attention. They don't like criticism or praise. Uh, sorry, they're, they're obsessed with criticism and uh, praise, so they do anything to please other people. Um, they constantly want reassurance. Somebody with borderline can be quite emotionally explosive, so they, they get quite upset quite easily. They get into arguments and fights quite regularly. They self-harm. So I think all of those things will probably... Um, affect how she behaves on a day-to-day -day basis i think it's just gonna be an emotional roller coaster ride i imagine she's not going to be somebody that is going to be able to just stay in a cell and and keep herself to herself and do her time i think she's going to be embroiled in so much drama that was interesting she used to write letters to the judge but sometimes also to the prison to complain as if she thought it's a hotel <laughs> Like this needs to improve and the food wasn't good, <laughs> like all of that. But what's interesting psychologically there is, you know how she said, Gannon, she she liked to, what we believe maybe, uh, humiliate him by saying he pooped his pants three times, on the hike three times, pooped his pants. And she's talking about him pooping his pants a lot. There's always the talk yeah. of constipation or the pooping on the pants. But yet in prison or in jail, when she was in jail, she's going to prison now, then she was writing letters to say that she's struggling with constipation and she's had laxatives and it's not helping. She's so obsessed with that. Isn't that a bit odd as well that she talks about the victim this way? Yeah, but then later yeah. she talks about herself that way and the enemas and everything. It's so weird. That is a bit weird. Yeah. I don't think I've ever come across anything like that, to be honest. Um, yeah. I have come across cases where somebody has delusional beliefs about various aspects of their physical health. Like they believe they're having heart attacks or they believe they've got cancer when when they don't and you know medical investigation has shown that so i don't know if that is this if that's the delusion i believe i think probably on balance it's not it's probably just a very weird preoccupation that she has what i was going to say is i think the problem is the distinction between the adjective narcissist versus the diagnosis of narcissistic personality disorder right so narcissist i guess probably includes anybody who's got a bit of an overinflated ego who is you know slightly full of themselves which probably encompasses a lot of people you know you could probably argue that a third of the population have narcissistic tendencies at times you know so that's that's too broad a category in my view to mean anything but then you get narcissistic personality disorder which like all personality disorders means that you struggle because of those, because of your character traits, you struggle to function in society. So it's not just being full of yourself, but it's being um, so kind of over-involved and, and so kind of egocentric, I guess is the word. So, you know, you literally think the whole world revolves around you. You think everybody deserves to compliment you and that, that everybody's there to help you in some way or another. Or if somebody insults you, then they're just the worst person in the world and their opinion doesn't count. Uh, so those kind of people that have that personality sort of clash constantly with others. And I suppose that they're, they're the kind of people, I don't know if you haven't met anybody like this, I certainly I have, who kind of steal all the conversation, who constantly talk about themselves. They don't, they don't care about you or your problems. and Everything is just turning the conversation into to them and their dramas. Yeah. So I suppose the trigger is quite broad, really. It can mean anything that 
causes or leads to any psychiatric symptom. So it could be as simple as somebody with a background depression gets triggered by an argument that they had with their neighbor. Or it could be something a bit more specific, like it could be somebody who's got, say, post-traumatic stress disorder because they were a soldier and they saw you know, horrific scenes of people getting blown up and they get triggered by somebody who looks like somebody who they saw get killed, for example. I suppose in the context that you're using it, maybe people, some people, especially on Twitter, <laughs> from my experience, kind of appropriate it and just get offended really easily. And it's their kind of reason for getting offended. But I think it should. what it should mean is, is something that, that causes a symptom of mental illness, but what it has become over time is something I don't like and therefore I'm going to bitch about. Yeah, I mean, it, it kind of piggies back onto stuff that we've already talked about, but just, just more reasons why I don't think this is dissociative identity disorder um, because apparently she claims that she was attacking demons that reminded her of her, her, her mother's partner's abuse. Did I get that right? Yes. So that, again, that uh, if you really pushed it as a stretch, you could probably say that might be linked to psychosis because you can have psychotic delusions about one person not being who they are. So they're called uh, delusions of misidentification. But that's separate to DID. So that doesn't all make sense. Uh, you know, is the, are the experts or are her, are her defense saying that she's psychotic or she's got DID? Because they're not the same thing. You can't just use them interchangeably. But also the very fact that she was kind of so 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 it's pure did means you can't remember the thoughts and, and actions of one of your alters one of your other people so it's not possible in my view for you to try and cover up the actions of somebody else uh, of one of your other alters and if you did do that if you do remember or feel guilty about or feel responsible for or want to cover up the crimes of one of your alters then surely by definition that means that you knew what you did right so then the sanity defense wouldn't work so it's just i'm just putting i'm throwing more spanners into her defense <laughs> right yes she needs it i mean her attorney was uh, like i'm gonna start working on the appeal now <laughs> good luck with that and then i believe you know a lot about the chris watts case so yeah what <laughs> i don't even know what to ask there's so much what <laughs> sure. can you tell well, us about it the thing that strikes me the most is that there's quite a few videos that i've seen on youtube calling chris watts a psychopath and I absolutely don't think he's a psychopath for the same reasons that I don't think that it should Storch is a psychopath. And I'll explain my, uh, my meaning now, which is this. Both of those, both those people did horrific, almost ununderstandable things uh, and showed a huge lack of empathy or, you know, a lack of care for their victims at the time. I suppose you could argue that Chris Watts's was probably even worse. I don't know, can you say worse? I suppose you could say worse because, you know, there were two victims who were his own children. He didn't have any relationship issues with their children, whereas Letitia clearly disliked her stepson over a long period of time. So it seems that Chris Watts is, I don't know, worse is probably the wrong word, but it seems more senseless, let's put it that way, less easier to, to kind of comprehend. But true psychopaths, I think, are very often misunderstood. So a true psychopath isn't just somebody that acts violently or, or that kind of loses their temper. In fact, it's kind of the opposite. It's somebody who has a lack of empathy but can control how they present themselves really well. Uh, and they're really manipulative. They're quite charming. They're quite deceitful. So Chris Watts was neither of those things. I think Chris Watts was in this relationship with Shannon. He, he didn't want to be in it, but he was actually a coward. He was too, he didn't have the balls to, to say to her, look, this is not working for me. I'm in love with somebody else. I want to leave you. He couldn't face that. So in his warped mind, he just thought, if I get rid of the problem and I get away with it, that's just so much easier than having to confront my, my wife who, who scares me. Um, and he, I suppose in other videos I've seen that he's kind of, that people have called him manipulative because he's lied to the police and because, you know, he tried to hide the bodies. That's not like being manipulative as a person. That's somebody doing something really bad and trying to cover their tracks. Probably a lot of people who would have done something that they know they're going to go to prison, um, prison for would make some sort of attempt to cover their tracks. So I think that's, that's natural behavior to what he did. I don't think what he did was natural, but it's a natural reaction to what he did to try and cover it up. That's not being manipulative. Being manipulative is when you fit into like a lifestyle of fooling lots of different people around you. It's when you stab all your friends in the back if you're a psychopath or you know um, you commit loads of fraud, for example, but you stay under the radar for many, many years and get away with it. That is what a true psychopath is. So I don't think either of these two uh, culprits are psychopaths. 
Sure. So I, I, just to reiterate, I don't think she's a psychopath because I don't think she's clever, manipulative or deceitful enough. I think she tried, but, you know, as I said, a true psychopath is actually quite good at it, almost by definition. So a true psychopath, someone like Ted, Ted Bundy, who, who does charm a lot of people and who a lot of people like, like even the police officers were joking around with her. The report, some of the reporters reported on him quite favorably because he was so good at getting into people's minds and, and appearing as charming. I don't think anybody is saying that Letitia is charming, so that doesn't make her a psychopath. But to to answer your question, I think she is somebody that's probably got a personality disorder, probably narcissistic personality disorder. Um, Does she have borderline? I think you could argue that she's got uh, definitely got some traits of borderline personality disorder. So I mentioned a couple of these briefly, but just for your viewers, it's people who can't deal with um, their emotions. So if they are in a, if they lose their temper or they get angry or, or in an argument, they kind of explode, which very possibly happened here. Uh, they tend to self harm. They tend to use drug and alcohol. Uh, they tend to have a shallow affect. So what that means is they never really feel anything particularly deeply. So when they're happy, they're a little bit happy. Um, but apart from anger, they don't really feel any, any positive emotions particularly well. And they, they have this like fear of abandonment. So they, they do, some quite extreme things so that other people in their lives won't leave them. So I think she's probably got some of those traits and she's definitely a narcissist as well. Yeah. So to summarize personality disorders, yes, mental illness, no. So the YouTube's the main <laughs> one. YouTube's the one that I, okay. that I care about the most. So that, that'd be great. Thank you. Awesome. Um, okay. And oh, actually, uh, you know what? I do have a media website, which I'll email you right now, which I which okay. get my input on. So it's just got like clips of, of times I've been on Yes, TV yes. Like I haven't seen it. I would love um, to see it. Cool. I'll do that. And yeah, thank you so much for having me on. It's been an absolute pleasure.